Welcome to Film Trays. This is a podcast where we trace the life of a film from conception to production all the way to release and reception. Uh, we ha- we always choose a new film or a film that is new to streaming. Chris, what do we have this week and who do we have with us this week? Yes. First off, uh, before you reveal this very important film, uh, let's uh, say hi to Mark and Bridget from the Screen Time A Quarantine podcast. Thank you guys for joining us. Yeah. Hello. When, you, when you started to say reveal, I thought you were going to reveal us. I thought we were the special. Oh, yeah. You know, you're much more special than this. <laughs> Are we the big <laughs> 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 Woohoo! Yeah. Yeah. Seven episodes and counting, I think. I love, love it. it. Something Sweet. like that. Oh, that's a that's about the same as us too. This is the twelfth episode, uh, oh. second season, second episode. So uh, same Z's. We're not that organized. No. <laughs> <laughs> the last episode, oh, but- we we were just we started recording while we were eating ice cream and then <laughs> talked about our feelings for a while. Yeah. yeah. That, that's fine. Yeah, is that, that's kind of what uh what the gist is of the podcast, right? Of uh, trying to. Uh, analyze uh movies and tv in the midst of this uh pandemic hellscape is that right is that a good, yeah, well, a good well, pitch? i know i know that you guys are regular listeners but uh uh <laughs> just to summarize for the folks who a don't huge listen, listen um show. it's we have two small children and we used to be pretty strict about screen time and the pandemic happened and we switched to you can watch tv from in the morning until i can't work anymore and have to do it. <laughs> um, so we decided we would do something with that as a family. So it's kind of, I mean, it's relatively unstructured, but the first half is us talking with our newly seven year old and four year old about kind of what they're watching. And we ask them questions from that uh, website, which is called uh, Common Sense Media. Common oh, right, Sense. right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it's their responses are hilarious, in my opinion, um, hilariously bad. And then um, we tell a joke as a segue because they our kids tell bad jokes and we want the world to know that and then we and then we yeah i mean analyze is a is a generous term we talk about things that we're um so yeah stuff that's getting us through the pandemic basically y- you riff but that's what yeah. the good podcasters do it's a lot it's a lot of riffing 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 yeah well thank you again for being with us we are here to talk about uh the 30th anniversary of a forgotten movie that was recently put on Hulu's uh, film streaming section. It is uh, Michael Cimino's Desperate Hours. Uh, You might know Michael Cimino more famously for creating, in my opinion anyways, and I think at least Dan agrees with me, one of the best movies of the 1970s, The Deer Hunter. Uh, And he had a pretty horrific fall from grace and uh, basically ended his career remaking a you know, pretty solid film noir from the 50s starring Humphrey Bogart. And this movie uh, also kind of holds a weirdly special place in my heart because it was kind of that first movie, to my best recollection anyways, where, uh, you know, remember getting those Cinemax or HBO free trials back in the 90s? Classic. For those of us that had basic cable and (laughs) wanted a a glimpse of the good life. I don't Um, remember I, this movie, I don't know if it was Cinemax or HBO, or maybe it was even Showtime, uh, you know, at 11 o'clock or midnight, just before, you know, the after dark stuff happened. Um, <laughs> I flipped and this movie came on and uh, it had me enraptured, enraptured and get it kind of kicked off a weird obsession with the home invasion genre of movies. <laughs> what? With- <laughs> How yeah, old I'm, were you? I'm, How old were you I'm, when this came on? How it's old, definitely uh, it's definitely a Cinemax film. It has to be. Yeah, okay, yeah, uh, that made more, that makes more sense. Cinemax. Um, yeah. I believe I must have been twelve. I'm, I'm guessing it was you know straight up mid nineties, ninety five, maybe ninety. Home invasion films. Okay. Yeah. Dive deeper on that. I want to know more about this. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I, I did happen to just because uh, I was unearthing a lot of uh, you know nostalgia for my weird uh, preteen obsession. <laughs> Uh, and I did a little timeline of the home invasion genre. Yes. <laughs> yes. This is what people come for. Is this. Like, like so other, uh, so many other subgenres of movies. Uh, it dates back to D.W. Griffith back in 1909. He put out a little film called The Lonely Villa. And it's, I mean, it's such a simple but often effective, um, but also very easily mis- you know, uh, executed um, idea, right? It's just like regular people in a house and then 
terror comes their way. It was also my sure. number one fear as a child. Was yeah. uh, I, like, I remember like laying in bed, probably because I watched a shit ton of these movies. But like yeah. I remember laying in bed and just staring at my window and just thinking through all the many different horrible scenarios that could unfurl if you know I hadn't locked my window that night or if somebody knew exactly how to climb the roof correctly to uh, break the window open. So yeah, I've, I mean I've got issues. As we all do. <laughs> that's a genre that's just kind of built on like the narrative of the like the middle class like um like what's at stake for that genre to be effective you know what i mean like yep even describing it as like regular people in their home minding their own business and, <laughs> and then criminals break in and like right so i i always i wonder a lot when i'm when i was watching this movie and like other because i like home invasion movies a lot too um and i was also <laughs> probably about the same age when i got really into them but like i've really tried to do a lot of reflection on like what specific yeah. white middle class fear does that play into mm -hmm. and values and also like what does that create the illusion of a need for yep absolutely it's home invasions right sure in my case, I, it was husband. That's it, that's directly why we're married. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm very effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm. I mean, I'm curious. Did you guys even know this movie existed before I told you I was picking it for the episode? Uh, I, I've, I've seen the first, the original one, but not the. Oh, new really? One. Yeah. yeah. I, I did not know it. Uh, I did not know of it, its existence. So I was because of my dad. It's my dad. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 <laughs> I watched the original one. I yeah. Imagine. Uh huh. Yeah, I had no clue what this was. And yeah. uh, it, even watching the trailer, you know exactly what you're getting here, right? It's one of those early 90s thrillers that is just mm -hmm. super pulpy. Um, and like he, the fact that Michael Cimino directed it is is just bizarre uh, for a lot of reasons. It's, you know, how did he end up making this film of all the films that he was trying to make? Um, you right. talk about somebody who is just... And it's so bizarre too, and his his legacy is all over the place because he died what twenty sixteen, um, mm -hmm. and when that happened, there was this you know outpouring of sort of oh my god, uh, the deer hunter, and then like this weird evaluate uh, reevaluation of Heaven's Gate happened, and people were like oh that's actually a masterpiece. It wasn't as bad as people thought it was. Yeah. Uh, the French love him apparently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean he's just <laughs> loved over there. Um, <laughs> But then, you know, you got stuff like this and uh, what what are his other big films from this era that you would say go along with? Is Year, Year of the Dragon like this? Yeah, I, I've never seen Year of the Dragon. Uh, it's definitely on my list now that I'm kind of rediscovering uh, this movie and also looking at the strange career filmography of Mickey Rourke. I mean, oh, of all people to put front and center of this movie... Uh, I mean, there's lots of different ways you could you could take that. Um, but essentially, that's what it was. Right. It was Mickey Rourke. Uh, he and like you put in our notes, Dan, like Jamino was trying to get a whole bunch of other stuff done, way more like high concept stuff. Yeah. Um, but then basically Mickey Rourke, uh, after a couple different other directors fell through and Rourke was already attached to a remake of Desperate Hours, oh. uh, he he just recommended to De Laurentiis, the uh, producer, like, why don't we get Chimino involved? And so I, I'd imagine that because they had such a strong connection uh, with both uh, the Year of the Dragon and um, uh, the Sicilian uh, a couple of years after that, that it was just like a no brainer. Like they were just kind of they were two Hollywood misfits, right? They had both had yeah. these horrible reputations of just being completely impossible to work with and so it makes sense that they kind of found each other and uh, kind of rode off into the sunset pretty uh unclimactically uh, <laughs> in the 90s like i mean i'm i'm having a lot more fun listening to you talk about this than when i had watching the movie <laughs> <laughs> that's what we try to do here yeah but, uh, it's, you know yeah. But can some, uncovering the the but um, I mean, for all the things that you're like saying and just, yeah, it was just, just something didn't like nothing clicked. Do you know what I mean? Oh yeah. There's like definitely a, a distance. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah. So like Dan, why do you think of all the things is, is there another reason other than Rourke or what brings so much talent? Cause it wasn't just Tamino and Rourke. Like you also have Anthony Hopkins who, yes, he's, yep. You know, he's his star is ascending at this point. Uh, but then also you've got this writing team 
that is just kind of plucked out of nowhere. They didn't really do much of anything at this point. <laughs> uh, Lawrence Connor and Mark Rosenthal. Um, but they had kind of gotten big as hired hands in Hollywood with uh, writing The Jewel of the Nile in 1985, the romance adventure mm-hmm. movie with Michael Douglas. Oh, yeah. Um, and... <laughs> And then that led to them getting the job for Superman for the quest for peace, notoriously known as like one of the worst superhero movies ever, even yeah. nowadays when we have a huge glut of them. Like what? Wh- why? Why give these guys a chance? They clearly like failed. Uh, I mean, is it just another instance of white guys in Hollywood failing upwards or I, I think it's so, it's the source material. Like, I yeah. feel like the, the story is already sort of it's proven um and it is crazy though you look at mimi rogers uh, kelly lynch getting those people right now in 1990 is pretty insane um i I do think it has to go back to the fact that like there's this pedigree to the the script and the story that's happening here and and i think that like they just wrote him a check and said hey you know we're going to keep you in the guardrails here because of this script um go for it essentially and he goes for it I mean, he doesn't hold back, right? Like, this is not a, I wouldn't call it a boring film. No. It's a pretty bizarre, uh, almost absurdist ad- adaptation of the original. Um, so I think they kind of got what they wanted. It is super over the top. It is, you know, graphic and gratuitous in a lot of different ways. I think the producers probably felt that with that traditional story that we know that works and this sort of, you know, firecracker that we got as the director and, and the lead it's going to create some magic. Uh, and that obviously, I don't think as we get to the sort of reception of this, it didn't happen. I mean, did you guys feel that sort of there was a palpable sort of energy happening here, even if it was sort of chaotic uh, and untamed? Did you guys feel that at all? Or do you felt like it was kind of like muted or boring? I, I thought, I thought kind of like a few things stuck out to me. One is like, even though it, like it kind of from a plot wise, it makes sense. <laughs> that uh, I thought it like for a few things stuck out just like it was like very nicely shot it did seem like beautiful um, yeah. yeah like it did have it it did have like I think the first like 20 minutes or so had kind of a bizarro energy that yeah that like absolutely it yeah. Was, I was intrigued I like mm-hmm. I'll I'll say that like it, and I can kind of follow that um with the who is who the stars were who the director was that it was it was genre but it was clearly kind of trying to do something kind of interesting with it at least at least initially i think yeah i think that i mean it was really beautifully shot the the way that it was shot and speaking of like home invasion movies it reminded me of the american remake of funny games yes like okay yeah I just kept thinking as I watched it, except mm-hmm. I wasn't scared. Like funny games is a movie that I actually, and I, I love horror as a genre and home invasion specifically. Um, but like that movie scares me. That movie I don't really want to watch. It makes me feel uncomfortable. This did not make me feel uncomfortable. Right. I mean, it wasn't effective in that way. Um, but talking about like the, so this being the remake and like the kind of energy, I think it loses energy in, in the second act. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. the other way that I felt when I was watching it, and I said this to Mark, like, so Chris, you thought the original movie was a masterpiece. I'm like, and it's classic for sure, but I never really enjoyed the old pulpy movies because I felt like the plots didn't make sense. And like, I always kind of had this, like, are they good though? Or is it just <laughs> that like, this is what we have? and like, they become the foundation. of it. So the other way I felt when I was watching this was like, uh, there was something there's something that um i'm being inarticulate i apologize but it it felt like um watching an opera how so um so and i'm a fan of opera so this is not necessarily a cut but like in the sense that the plot is almost inconsequential it's getting all these characters together to do specific things right and so it doesn't have to make sense it doesn't have to be there's nothing it's not realistic like they're not going for realism at all um, and it's sort of just like these over the top tropes of characters. So I don't know if we want to get into this yet, but like the, the Mickey Rourke's character and how he keeps coming back to this theme of like the truth, but you're not telling me the truth. Like, and just like these absurd, like yeah. things that are thrown in and like these tropes of like, who is Anthony Hopkins? He's not really a person. He's like a, 
you know, he's a w archetype. And um, but then also the same way that like there's all this energy in the first act and then the second act just that's where I felt kind of bored, even though that's also where all the action is. And I feel that way often when I'm at an opera. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the film certainly <laughs> takes a, a strange turn, not even a strange turn. It's strange before it gets to the house mm -hmm. and when it gets to the house, it becomes like this very kind of plotting home invasion movie. You know how it's going to end. Uh, the cues are all there and they're well choreographed. Um, yeah. And I, I don't know, like the it's interesting that it, it's based on a true story. So like the play and the um, and the original movie or novel, I should say, mm -hmm. um, were based on a real life incident. Uh, where a family in Pennsylvania, they were in, uh, their home was invaded. They were kept captive for 19 hours. Uh, it became this huge sensational story, which is why the, the author wrote this book. Mm -hmm. um, but what's fascinating about the actual story is that what, how the people were actually treated was not that bad. They were mm -hmm. essentially sort of quote unquote kidnapped for 19 hours and the guys just left. But what happened was that Life Magazine thought they had a great story here and sensationalized it actually went back to the house where it happened, shot photos with actors and put it in the magazine saying that it was like this very pulpy, violent sort of um, invasion of a home. The mm -hmm. family actually then sued uh, and it, it actually became um, the foundation of libel, like some libel laws in the United States. It's one of the reasons why you can't sue the National Enquirer for telling a lie is this case. Um, <laughs> And it's it's just bizarre when you think about that, like that sensationalist angle has played out through this entire sort of story where mm -hmm. in the original, I think a lot of those elements were played down where it was about sort of giving actors this room and space to really emotionalize their characters, yeah. and, and put, you know, have, you know, kind of show off a little bit that part of it. But when you see Chimino's vision of it, I mean, it just seems so bombastic. Mm -hmm. uh, and even the acting in and of itself inside the home, you look at someone like Anthony Hopkins, who is a classically trained actor, uh, Lindsay um, Krauss, who plays the FBI. She's classically trained as well. Uh -huh. um, she's kind of, he kind of just lets them run wild. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. Do you, I, I think that's one of the major downfalls of this film is that Shimino obviously has this wide angle view of everything and wants to make it very beautiful and lush and bold. And with his actors, he kind of, he lets them run wild. And I think that like, do you feel like that might be part of the downfall here that they're not sticking, tr you know, back to that strong script or do you think there's something else happening here? You know, I think that when I was, and I was just rewatching the original Bogart version um, before we got on the call here. And one thing that I noticed about it, especially watching it just 24 hours after I rewatched the 1990 version was um, how much that first act was simplified in the original mm -hmm. and how much then, like you said, Dan, they were trying to focus on the actual performances. Like so much of, the, you know, the 40s and 50s movies were essentially stage plays. Right. With yeah. Roving cameras. Teleplay. Right. Yeah. Is a teleplay. Yeah. yeah. And and so like the it almost felt like a challenge to Chipino to be like, OK, uh, and one thing that was interesting about the backstory of the production is that originally it was going to shoot in Texas yeah. and Ch Chimino then started scouting locations for whatever reason. I don't know. He follows his heart's desire in Utah and he's like, oh, let's do this in Utah. This makes more sense. And which is such a bizarre thing for a number of reasons, first and foremost, because you only get to see those beautiful Utah landscapes and sunsets right. for like a very small portion of the film. Yeah. And and but so then he like pushes his camera inside the house and mm -hmm. then it's like, a, you know, an obstacle to him. Like how 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 crazy can I get? Yeah, with exactly. Making this this basically play uh, come alive as an actual film rather than just, a, you know, a, a televised play. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, when you look at a lot of the other pieces, like you brought up the idea of like the bombast and he also clearly directed his uh film composer uh towards this this was one of like yeah. leonard malton's most hated movies of the 90s of 1990 <laughs> because yeah. of this score which or is just completely top. over the top oh, and the funny thing about this, the score is not only is it the same guy that shimino worked with on heaven's gate 
Uh, and that was this guy, David Mansfield's first score. But the guy also was the pedal steel player for Bob Dylan's band back in the 70s. Oh. So yeah. clearly he's not like a guy like you talk about classically trained Hopkins. Like they, Chimino had no interest in getting if he had interest in classically trained anybody, it was, he was interested in like mashing that together with the really like rough and tumble, like rock and roll people like Rourke and his score composer. Yeah. Well, I, I find it interesting that like I was watching some interviews with him, uh, Chimino talking about, he was talking about heaven's gate, but it was kind of talking about his philosophy of filmmaking and he said over and over again that like, I've never been trained as a writer and I've <laughs> never been trained as a filmmaker. And he said essentially, and this is an interview probably, you know, maybe five years before he died. Um, and he said that that made me better at all of those things because I was not classically trained. So he has this weird sort of rebellious uh, part of him, but at the same time, you can tell that he has such a high respect for artists. Mm -hmm. And when, um, you know, Mimi Rogers in this, who plays Nora, uh, she did an interview back in the 90s talking about being on set with him for this film. Uh, and she said he was amazing with the actors. Uh, he was so supportive and he really sort of gave them the confidence to put in really, really go for it, I guess. Um, I don't know if that worked. I don't think it did. Like you go, you watch this and it's everything is so over the top. <laughs> you can't take anybody seriously. Yeah. Uh, and I think central to that is the the Mickey Rourke character. I, the thing that kept coming back to me over and over again while watching this is, does he work in this role? I think he's <laughs> he can be a, a fantastic actor. I mean, The Wrestler is probably one of my favorite films, and I think probably his best performance, if not, you know, at least top two or something like that. Um, but do we think he actually works in this? Because he's really... Is it the protagonist? Who's the protagonist? That's another huge question that, that shows up. Like, who really is the focus of this film? But I do think, um, you know, Mickey Rourke is the linchpin to this narrative and the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, do we think that it was kind of faded to fail from the start because he was in that role? Or do we think that he got bad direction or was he too deep into drugs? Um, <laughs> what do we what do we think there? I think what well, one thing Bridget pointed out to me uh just his overall style is like it, uh, like he could clearly be like a bruce willis type maybe mixed with i don't know like a like a skeetier bruce willis maybe or like a seedier bruce willis yeah um i like, yeah like i agree with you dan like he has a like a certain energy i guess yeah on screen but like it's yeah i i agree with you guys as far as his filmography i was looking through it this morning and it's just like he's been in so many movies and all of them are like direct to video direct like it's, it's like trash yeah. it's just like it doesn't something doesn't add up i don't know what what are you gonna say bridget Sorry. oh i i actually um think that mickey rourke works in the part he did he was yeah. getting like heavy Bruce Willis vibes, in my opinion. Um, and it might've even just been like the voice. I, I don't know. But uh, um, I thought that the other actors acting around him didn't work. Interesting. Like, Did so, anybody specifically come, out, come, come to mind? I thought Anthony Hopkins was... Oh, yeah. The worst. Oh, totally miscast. Yeah, totally. Like, terribly miscast. Classic, yeah. like... Yeah. Well, but like miscast, but like he's a good enough actor that I feel like... So like when you say Dan that the the he he let the actors just kind of run wild like it felt like watching it like they weren't given any direction or character backstory or any <laughs> yeah. any motivations yeah I just kept thinking but why like but why like are we supposed to care about Anthony Hopkins wanting to get back with his wife because I feel like we are oh, right I so, guess. So yeah won't yeah. is he yeah. supposed to be like a loving father in any way because. Like I could, I couldn't get over the first scene with him where he's like, "Come with daddy, you want to kiss?" And then, oh god, it's so crazy. <laughs> I, I'm a regular American veteran. Like what? No, yeah, like a Vietnam vet. Like what? <laughs> he has a British accent. That doesn't make any sense. So, for a Vietnam vet, like, why are you so bad at like fighting? Like hand to hand <laughs> like combat. Fighting. Yeah, like, that's right. You really got his ass kicked. <laughs> like stop it this makes multiple me... times but then yeah. the, the other actor and i apologize i can't, can't remember her name but the whoever played the daughter oh, oh yeah man. i don't know her name she was in a lot, a lot of, of 90s movies oh so, like um Shawnee i can't Smith. The, yeah. the right word but it was just like like someone told like she had an acting coach or someone told her like just 
every fourth word, just like yell it. Like <laughs> I, I, I'm not trying to like, you know, be a total asshole, but like the, all the, the family members together didn't seem like it was just really hard. I thought Mickey Rourke was like, in terms of acting, like he seemed the most believable as that character. Yeah. I don't think I, I call him a protagonist necessarily. <laughs> because I don't think we were meant to empathize with him. Were we? Um, and then no, I don't think so. No. And then the the um the defense attorney. Oh, is, Kelly Lynch. Yeah. Yeah, like, like she also, I felt like just they didn't like actually use her at all. I was yeah. more intrigued by her story than anybody else's story yeah. here because yeah, like they, she, I, there was something it. so I don't know what it was about that character that was just intriguing. And they, well, they, they frame doing? it. They frame it so that she seems to be kind of like the default like audience stand in right especially oh, from yeah. the beginning but then right. it's just it just takes this total 180 and it doesn't help at all like i agree i think mickey rourke works it as that character and it even works as if it, he was a protagonist but it, it it definitely falls apart once you get the other uh characters involved but the okay. thing that bothered me the most uh and maybe this was on purpose i don't know what you guys think but rourke and lynch had no chemistry whatsoever so like I didn't buy it from the get go. I mean, that... I don't know. I kind of disagree. Really? I felt like the, I felt like there was some sort of spark there, but I, I think Chimino, and this is going to be really critical because I, I haven't seen a lot of his other work. I've just really seen um, Deer Hunter and, and parts of Heaven's Gate. Uh, his depiction of women in this oh, is pretty it's upsetting. Like. Yeah, <laughs> it's it just across the board, like, and Kelly Lynch's character specifically, just I don't know. It just he, it seemed like everything was like with the women specifically, the way he visualized them. Um, I, and I'm thinking of the two college girls that um, Albert comes across after he <laughs> oh, dumps the body. Those two college girls that are like going like ATV oh. riding and like they're basically half naked. Yeah, um, get away from Chimino us, just doesn't. I don't think he understands women all that well, uh, and especially not like their motivations and emotional reality. Right. And so, like, I feel like the Lynch character, I, I felt like th he kind of played her as he double played her. He played her on one hand as like this femme fatale in the beginning mm -hmm. and the FBI yeah. agents like she's so smart, blah, 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 blah. But the moment she gets caught, she collapses like a house of cards. Yeah, uh, that's where there actually felt like there was a connection because it's like Mickey works a sociopath. So like he's going to attach to somebody who has a weak psyche like that. Yeah. But it's just I don't know his depiction of, of the females in this movie I, was all over the place. And I thought, I don't know, Bridget, as the only woman on this podcast, what do you what do you think about his depiction? Well, first, I have to just say that the the our, we're talking about a home invasion movie and our dog just barked really ferociously at the back door for the first time ever in his dog life. Oh, so I just, yeah, I know the, um, uh, the other thing watching all these movies as a kid made me realize is that have as many dogs as you can when, as an adult. Always have dogs. Um, so many dogs. But um, no, yeah, I'm poor women characters. I mean, like, so I, I thought the women were all written pretty much like hysterical. Yeah. Hysterical. Like, like, yeah. Those were the notes like, so like, uh, mother separating from your husband, um, hysterical. Uh, daughter has a boyfriend, doesn't mad at her dad for his infidelity, hysterical. Um, I, yeah, I kept thinking too, like this woman, um, Kelly Lynch. Like, Kelly Lynch. I'm so sorry. Kelly Lynch. Also, Angle, by the way, she is uh, born and raised in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Well, how do you like that? Yeah, she is Golden you like Valley. <laughs> you can tell of the hair. Yeah. Um, but uh, so she's she's a defense she should be pretty intelligent so also thinking about like the profile level of this criminal like wouldn't right. he, wouldn't he have a pretty like sought after defense attorney maybe? well that's part of the plot i don't understand because she was supposed to be doing this pro bono or something right. she's rich right her family's rich or something yeah All i don't know but no i thought that she was a i thought she was a weak character and they didn't use her the mother was a weak character and then the daughter uh, the best female character was the FBI agent, but yeah. she, but she wasn't like utilized. She could have been. I mean, right? Yeah. She was an archetype of like female character who's like they put her in a boss role, and right. she just acts yeah. like a like a really mean boss. Right. Yeah. And you're like, that's not 
That's Watch not no. Like, that's not really it. what. You should, yeah. like, it's just kind of ridiculous. No, um, I, so I I always like it's easy to say like what would I do in a home invasion situation and <laughs> I don't right? like I probably wouldn't handle it well. However, this home was enormous with lots yeah. of ways to exit, and like I feel like the mom yeah. and children had so many different opportunities to just leave, like just run Absolutely. to a neighbor's house yelling all the way. Like, I, I don't know, like, and it, but instead they were all too busy just like being hysterical yeah. and like immediately looking to like the father figure who just like moments ago was clearly like not someone that anyone cared for or could trust. <laughs> right. But like the moment that there's danger, it's like, oh, I don't know what to do. I'm not <laughs> strong. Like, I mean, it was that it was hard to watch on that level. I mean, Kevin McAllister was eight years old. Right? <laughs> Came out the same year, didn't it? I think. Yeah, that's yeah, right. One I thought was homework. Oh, maybe, maybe it was on today. I like was around the same time. I think so. Yeah. yeah I believe so. All right. Yeah. I. I mean, I agree with everything you were saying, Dan. Just poorly, poorly written women. Yeah. Like you have some actresses there who can do some stuff. Hundred percent. Yeah. Like let them do it. I don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> can we talk about uh what uh what happened when this movie actually came out? Because yeah. it seems like we yeah, you bring up a good point, like Home Alone, the the top grossing right. film of 1990, yeah. also a home invasion movie, technically. Uh-huh. And and was it I mean, was that it? Was it just that people were sick of it at, at this point? I mean, two years later, Scorsese's Cape Fear comes out. Uh, yeah. What? Why? I mean, Rourke is huge still off of the nine and a half weeks mm-hmm. uh, fame. And Anthony Hopkins uh, is a, is a big name why why don't people go to see this is it just because of bad reviews i i, mean, I, I was yeah i don't know i, w- I was thinking it, it what we talked about a little bit earlier is it felt a little bit like it was two different movies where the first half was kind of this chimino home invasion bizarro energy and then the second half was like that's where i felt like it became like a studio project and yeah. it's Typically, like a diehard ripoff. Yeah, in in a way that it, it felt like I think Dan, you were saying earlier, like it felt like much less compelling when it became a very predictable thriller about that. Like suddenly became much more focused on FBI agents resolving the home invasion. That like it honestly, like it didn't seem like it was that dangerous of a situation. I guess based on how it was set up. I don't yeah. know. I well, I think. A, oh, go ahead. M question that I should. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. was Deer Hunter a box office hit? Uh, yeah, it was. It was very yeah. well received. It was. Uh, and that then that reception helped it win uh, a lot of. I mean, one best picture and best director. Right. Um, and like, yeah, it was very popular. Um, and this one was just eviscerated by critics. I mean, if you look at like the Rotten Tomato score is thirty six percent. Yeah. Um. To me, the telltale sign of this thing bombing is the cinema score of a C plus. Uh, and that's just like anything below a B for a new movie like this um, or a bigger movie like this is just pretty terrible. Um, it, 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 you know, and unlike, you know, something like Heaven's Gate where people have gone back and reevaluated it and say, hey, Chimino's is obviously a genius. Um, you go back and you watch this and it's just it, it's a mess. Right. I don't think is there anything is there a redemption here for desperate hours that we're going to achieve or is that oh, impossible? It's, it's not happening. I thought, um, I thought it was shot really well. Yes. Yeah. And I did want to mention gorgeous. the cinematographer uh, is Douglas Milsom, who his first movie he ever uh, was DP on was full metal jacket three years yeah. before this. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and so like he was Stanley Kubrick's right hand man for Barry Lyndon and, all that and so like the, the man clearly knows his stuff he also did last mohegans in the 90s and robin hood prince of thieves which you know what say what you will about it it's also a beautifully shot uh, yeah. version of that story um yeah. and and so it really feels like like i, I don't know to, not to repeat myself but like going back to what i was saying earlier it, they they really tried for something here and yeah. they just oh, fell yeah. flat on their faces that's what they put their chips on the producers. They put their chips on these guys is going for it mm-hmm. and they certainly went for it, uh, but that's a bet, you know, it's not always going to work out. Um, in this case, it doesn't work out at all. I mean, it's a complete you know, a debacle of a film. Yeah. Um, 
and you know i think it kind of signals uh, you know the weakness in shimino in general that like and you see this throughout the film like these certain lines that um he work would say about the vietnam war in america oh, yeah. where he was trying to like really elevate this narrative to like a philosophical text right um and it never clicks obviously and it doesn't click because the basic story doesn't make any sense on any level um which is bizarre because it's based on a well-proven uh story that worked in the past and worked in a movie it's why and you so, don't hire the guys who wrote superman 4 to write it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i think that's what you, at the end of the day that's where it kind of falls apart right or where do you guys think it falls apart where is the the fatal flaw in this film because i think we all agree that it's an absolute travesty of a movie but where is the fatal flaw do you guys think I'm going to say a combination of like writing and acting and I don't fault the actors. So like, I don't know what you would call that then like writing and direction. Yeah. I think that's a good, yeah. I think the casting was really good. Yeah. But, I, like, and like the actors themselves, right. are are great. Uh, and other things, but uh, yeah, I think um, Chimino's direction of the actors would be the fault there. Yeah. Um, Mark and, and Chris, what do you guys think is the fatal flaw here? Well, I would be remiss not to to go this entire podcast without mentioning, uh, you know, iconic '90s character actors David Morse and Elias Koteas as uh, Rourke's okay. uh, sidekicks. And like, I just I love those guys. They both like da- Morse's like sad puppy dog eyes get me every time, even if he plays the most despicable human ever. And Koteas, who's like totally is probably his character in Thin Red Line, uh, his, some of the lines he has in that movie, just like has so made, good. made him just like a, a go-to, you know, that guy actor for me. Um, so I, it's it, like, like Bridget said, it's hard to fault the actors because they, yeah. they tried, but yes, I also kind of can envision Chimino in the back, in the back, you know, after doing a line of Coke, yelling at Hopkins <laughs> and being like, just be a bad dad, Anthony. What else do you want me to say? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think Chimino's just kind of off the rails here and Rourke's sliding along with him and it's just a, kind of a foregone conclusion. What do you think, Mark? I, yeah, I, I, I go back to it, like what it, what feels like and I think reading reading your guys' notes on, on the movie, it seems like the way the movie came together was that, it, like you were saying earlier, Mickey Rourke was attached to the movie um, a lot of di- different directors passed. It almost became like a like less of a like a work like a work of passion and more like a product that's being made. And I think mm. like it seemed like yes. Then at the end of the day, you got some really good actors. You got some uh, uh, good good directors in general. But at the end of the day, it's still. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, they're trying to make a movie that is going to get a good ROI mm-hmm. more than like have a, you know, yeah. be like a true kind of like. Um, I wonder like, too, like, sorry, I, like, yeah, I, I feel like if they had just like, if, if they just gone for it and like, this is a genre piece. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally. That, like that could have been cool. Or if they had just gone for it and said like, this is a character thing. And we're going to use these mm-hmm. actors and it's going to be like heavy performances. But it was almost like, what if we did both, but neither happened? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it feels like, right? Um, yeah. Cause at first I thought, Oh, it's, they're taking like the genre piece approach and this is going to be fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, totally. And I, I think Mickey Rourke was playing it like a genre film. Yes. hundred percent. Yeah. And no one else was in on that is kind of what it felt like too. I think he I, got it. He got the genre play. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder um, too, like, um, it seemed like the, in terms of like box office, like it's hard to say exactly why something fails, but a lot, there are a lot of good thrillers in the early nineties and late eighties. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Well, I like, I was almost thinking like, but what if this was released not in 1990? <laughs> um, like, was it also just like a bad year for mm-hmm. like a, a thriller miss mm-hmm. and like talking about like the, having some diehard vibes. Like you also have Mickey Rourke who I think is great, but he's also like, he's, He's um, he's not quite Bruce Willis, and he's not quite Michael Douglas, right? Like, I mean, he like he's not quite these other actors who do a lot of thrillers. 
yeah of the time you know what i mean yeah totally mm-hmm. or like thriller slash slash action because then the second half there are a lot of moments where it felt like now it's more like action kind of mm-hmm. um yeah but yeah i don't know I yeah w- he I wasn't say- exactly a draw was he right i don't know like the ni- early 90s all that much of mickey rourke but i knew i know after this movie he dropped out and became a professional boxer right for like four or five years <laughs> yeah after playing a boxer a couple times yeah like an idiot like we're watching the movie and like 20 minutes in i'm like which one's mickey Rourke? <laughs> 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 like it's that yeah. guy and i was like oh. no his face <laughs> i know oh. yeah his that's sad. But- I don't know. I mean, I was trying to like do some box office analysis of Mickey Rourke movies. And uh, yeah, nine and a half, nine and a half weeks was 86. That mm-hmm. movie made over a hundred million dollars, which is crazy for 86. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and so, 86 dollars like, it did. Yeah. 19. Oh my God. Yeah, unadjusted. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So like clearly, wow. you know, people were, and people were just like holding out for Mickey, like in 1987. I, one of, I actually love this movie. I mentioned it on the podcast last week, Angel Heart with De Niro uh, and and Mickey Rourke, this like weird, like Southern Gothic uh, movie. Um, And then he did uh, Homeboy in 88, which was just like a a nothing movie about a boxer, but was clearly like the first like realization where he's like, maybe I can just do this rather than have to deal (laughs) with like reshoots. Um, And then in 89, he did Johnny Handsome, uh, Walter Hill neo noir with uh, uh, Forrest Whitaker and Morgan Freeman. I've, I've never heard of this movie, but it was a huge bomb. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it just seems like he just made bad choices. And like we said earlier, he had a notorious reputation of just not being pleasant on a, yeah. a film yeah. set, having mm-hmm. lots of problems. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we think this is a failure of a home invasion film, do we have any suggestions about great home invasion films we can give people? So they're not, you know, after they watch this, they got to wash something else down. What, what do you guys think? Is there anything out there that, uh, that you would point people in, in that direction? So the, this is going to sound, but so funny games I already mentioned, which I, I think is great film. Just like, I mean, so effective, like, but I almost, also, but I almost don't want to recommend it. <laughs> yeah. It's almost, I mean, it's too unnerving for a lot of people. It's yeah. really unnerving. Um, but the other film that this made me think of, I don't know. Tell me if you, if this counts as a home invasion film. But the Last House on the Left. Oh my sure. god! It's yeah. also really hard to watch, and there are some really hard to watch. Just have some yeah. of the same, like in the moments where this was really effective. I was like, oh, this makes me feel like I'm watching mm. Last House on the Left. Like, yeah. So those are two of the I I don't want to call them my favorites because that makes me sound like a creep, but <laughs> yeah. uh, last house on the left was banned in a lot of countries. So yeah, it's pretty, it, I mean, yeah. it really is like, I, I don't actually think I ever want to watch it again, but yeah, it's that, like, that's when West I Craven, right? grave, it's, yeah, Wes Craven's first yeah. home, which it was, oh, he didn't, he couldn't get the MPA even to look at it. He didn't know how to. So he just like faked an MPA <laughs> rating and put it in front of the film. Yeah. He it, started playing in New York. Um, uh, Chris, you're the home invasion expert. Okay. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. What are your I, I do, in the right direction? Well, I do. I do genuinely enjoy Scorsese's uh, remake of Cape Fear in '92. I think that's a good example of a movie that's just like super bonkers and leans into the genre, mm-hmm. um, which is something you wouldn't expect from Scorsese. Uh, mm-hmm. But similarly, uh, not the new one, but the original Straw Dogs. From 1971 uh, oh, by yeah. Sam Peckinpah. Also, yeah, yeah. kind of like I don't necessarily want to recommend it because, like Bridget yeah. said, it's super unnerving, um, mm-hmm. but it's really well done and is is like a really good example of kind of combining the home invasion thriller with the vacation thriller because it's like a vacation home that gets invaded um, by uh, uh, Killer Hicks. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, we did just have a really awesome home invasion movie last year. With uh, Jordan Peele's Us, technically. Oh yeah, so good. Would you classify that as a home invasion? Though I mean, yeah, I guess so. I mean, the yeah, it's uh, I guess it's the more, first part of it. That. Yeah. That way, yeah. What's the recent home invasion? Relatively recent home invasion thing that came out that like the the twist was like one of the people involved, like it was all a setup for some kind of inheriting money, and one of the people involved was like a survivalist and just like kicked everyone's butt does that sound familiar at all is that don't breathe oh uh 13 cloverfield lane no oh. <laughs> <laughs> i love that movie uh, I so I, I mean, 
yeah that's all that's all it, it, oh i think i know what you're talking about yeah it sounds familiar it, it's uh, like not like a great movie by any means but it was enjoyable and it was uh so basically like a, a woman is dating or engaged to a guy and goes to like his family's home uh-huh and like he's like oh my family's super wealthy and they're all kind of assholes and she's getting to know everyone oh, ready or and, not Ready no. Or not. no, it's not ready. <laughs> no, it was, it was <laughs> we're gonna figure out what this movie is. This is amazing. Let's keep going. Yeah. And so, like, things start to happen where um, people start trying, like, home invasion things of like bows and arrows coming through the house, and like, and like, it was at, like it, the twist is that it it was a setup from the brothers to like kill all the family members, like the parents and the other siblings, to like solely inherit the money. And then, like, the fiancé was there to have, like, someone outside the family there to make it believable. But this fiancé slash girlfriend was raised (laughs) in, like, a survivalist compound and just, like, messes the whole thing up by, like, saving it. Like, by, like... I want to see this, this movie. I don't, whatever awesome. It is. Uh, what? this, this next on Film Trace is the <laughs> untitled movie. <laughs> no, I didn't dream that. I mean, it sounds like a mixture of Ready or Not and The Hunted is what I'm getting at. Yeah, right yeah there's a little, yeah. I, I, will, I will research it. I will figure it out and I will follow up and let everyone know what it was. <laughs> yeah, please, please do. Uh, what's, uh, what's your fave home invasion film, Mark? Um, You know, as I, I'm listening to you guys talk, I'm realizing I actually don't. <laughs> I don't like the genre. Like it actually makes me feel bad. It's a terrifying genre. I don't like it yeah. either. It makes me really but, upset. I, but on that on that note, like on the flip side of you, Bridget, like Funny Games is probably my favorite one of the genre, only because it's like a it's. I don't even necessarily see it as a genre piece as much as it is like uh, it's like a of critique the, of the genre yes, and yeah, of audience true. in general. It's so true. it's very self-aware. It's all it's it's yeah. I mean, it's supposed to be like super right. dark humor. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Other than like, I know one of the movies on, on the list that she had, Chris, is uh, The Strangers. And I know that's that's a movie yeah, that freaks out Bridget. And I like that's a movie that just kind of left me feeling like icky, but also not scared i don't know yeah. yeah i mean that that i mean that, i think that was kind of the the deal with like the late 2000s early 2010s because yeah. you had the, the purge right after that right uh this like just i mean they they want you to feel gross inside it yeah. seemed like for a lot of these these types of movies i mean it's effective but yeah, uh, yeah not enjoyable as, as somebody who enjoys staying inside and like being <laughs> Like it, there's some, there's, and like people not bothering me. It's kind of uh, digs deep into what I don't want to, what I don't want to experience. Uh, Chris, you're not going to mention Panic Room. From- uh, yeah, it's it's on my list for sure. <laughs> uh, I am a, a noted Jodie Foster aficionado, and yeah. So when when that movie was coming out and it was being directed by David Fincher, like I was all in. I saw that open. I saw that the Friday it came out. Um, <laughs> But uh, no, it's it's not great. <laughs> uh, I mean, Jared Leto as the as the lead villain kind of ruins everything. Um, but I, Oscar I, I, winner Jared Leto. <laughs> oh, that's weird. It is weird. Um, the only one I would mention that's on this list, and I don't know if it really counts because it's more of a traditional slasher horror, would be Black Christmas, um, the oh, yeah. original. Oh so, yeah, Canada, so good. Um, if you haven't seen that, do check it out. Any final thoughts on Michael Cimino's 1999 Desperate Hours? Any sort of closing musings on this uh, mess of a genre flick? I am now just so desperately trying to find out this movie that I remember. <laughs> <laughs> it makes you think of movies you can't quite put your finger on. Yeah, right. it, it almost felt... Like deja vu as I was watching it because it reminded yeah. me of so many other things. The other thing it made me think of is in cold blood, which like I don't know that was oh, weird. Totally, yeah. yeah, that's a really good. Yeah. Point. And you and I mean definitely watching the movie, you keep thinking like there's got to be something deeper that like is like Capote ish that could un, un that could reveal like the true motivations of these killers. Um, just, but but there's nothing. There's <laughs> nothing there. I have to say as a closing thought though, I I don't not recommend it. It, it, I mean, it's oh, yeah. worth seeing if you're into Chimino. I mean, the opening, honestly, the opening minute or whatever many shots of her driving through that, those mountains, that's gorgeous. I know, I could watch that. For and I was like, I just, is this Deer Hunter part two? I was just like, just do this for two hours and I'll be happy. Um, 
but yeah, I would say that's a good point that it's not, I think we're making it out. It's, it's not a good movie, but it's certainly an interesting watch, which is, I think one of the reasons why we chose it. It's, there's a lot to dive into here with why doesn't it work? Why is it all over the place? You know, what was he trying to accomplish? He falls short clearly, but he definitely swung for the fences. Um, Chris, any closing thoughts that you have about the film or Mark? I mean, I'm now I'm on a Google chase because uh, Chimino <laughs> actually this was his penultimate film. His last yes, feature yeah. length movie is The Sun Chaser from 96, which yeah. never got a proper release, even though it was nominated for the Palme d'Or at Cannes. And uh, it, it, it sounds just like bonkers. I, it stars Woody Harrelson and Anne Bancroft. Woody Harrelson uh, is a uh, a doctor who's a uh, patient who is a convicted murderer takes him hostage and they try to flee Los Angeles. Um, but it's nowhere to be found. So, um, I think, uh, the moral of the story is, uh, and I tried, I was so happy to see that this desperate hours was on Hulu. Um, maybe, uh, the, the, the moral is, uh, don't worry too much about those nostalgic strongholds and maybe it's okay to just let some things go. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Just let, leave them where they are. Just let let it go. Better. <laughs> uh, I found the movie. It's called what You're Next. Oh, You're Next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I never saw that one. Oh, I okay. definitely want to see that now. Um, yeah, maybe maybe I'll make Mark watch it again with me and we can <laughs> we can quarantine I can family. revisit my yeah. feelings about home invasion films. Mm-hmm. But um, it, is, Mark, it is more slasher than, I mean, it's not, yeah. So. Yeah. Mark and Bridget, when are you guys doing your next podcast? Give it, give it a plug. <laughs> Uh, we we took a, a bit of a hiatus after yeah. six grueling episodes, <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, now are releasing a new a new episode every Friday. New episode every Friday. Kick yeah. your weekend off mm-hmm. with a blast of our obnoxious, precocious children. We're not sure yet what we'll be talking about, but the kids will be talking about uh, Harry Potter and the something something. What's the second Harry, Harry Potter? Harry Potter 2. Harry Potter 2. Chamber of Secrets. Chamber of Secrets. There it is. I love it. Excellent. Excellent. But, um, are there are there any uh, common sense media questions about being a turf? Oh, probably not. <laughs> okay. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. <But> tune in. <laughs> Thank um, you so much to Mark and Bridget for joining yeah, us on Film Trace. Thanks for having us, guys. Thanks for getting us to watch a movie that I wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, hopefully a, a lot of other people listening are watching this movie for the first time, too, and, and yeah. enjoying it for what it's worth. Um, okay, so uh, next week we are going to do, and I hate to do this, um, <laughs> Chris is choosing the old films, I'm choosing the new films, uh, Hubie Halloween, uh, the Adam Sandler uh, Netflix Halloween movie. I searched <laughs> high and low for something new to watch that was worth talking about. Uh, and unfortunately, I chose probably what's going to be the, one of the worst movies uh, we're going to see this year. But I think it's going to be an interesting conversation. Yeah. Uh, we'll probably it be off next weekend, but back on the week yeah. after. With in, in two weeks. Halloween. Give us yeah, some breathing yeah. room. Um, yeah, I'll be interested to see uh, how Adam Sandler chose to follow up Uncut Gems. This is that'll be. <laughs> it's all a tax dodge. We all know this. <laughs> all right, thanks for listening. Uh, this has been Film Trace. <laughs>